Recently, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Steph Bright of Capital Learning for an interesting discussion around the need to innovate and innovation at work. Uh, arguably, it's, it's now more important than ever before in this, this post-COVID world that we're all inhabiting, or still COVID world, really, if we're being honest. A few key themes emerged uh, during our conversation. I think one is, is obviously diversity, and, and diversity, you know, has got, uh, you know, a, a, a physical manifestation, but I think more, you know, cognitive diversity as well. Uh, and, you know, those different skills and backgrounds that, that people from various teams can bring the, to the table when we're problem solving or trying to be creative. Uh, the second one was the, the need to be bored and, and feeling comfortable leaning into boredom. And, you know, we all know that we have our best ideas in the shower. I think that's a universal human experience. And then the last piece was around how do we innovate at home? You know, so much of innovation comes from riffing off, you know, team members, being in the same room, having debate. And, you know, that is quite difficult to do via a Zoom or Teams call. So we gave some tools there that, that might help with that. For me, I think one of them is actually stopping typing and getting things out. You know, I've got my trusty whiteboard covered in scribble next to me right here. Take a listen to the rest of the chat. So, Steph, thanks for joining me. Maybe before we launch uh, into the conversation, tell me a little bit about the work you do with Capita. Sure. So, um, yeah, part of Capita Learning. So um, in my current role, I've been there for about two years now um, in the service design team. So I work on um, mostly managed service solutions. So where big companies um, are outsourcing a lot of their learning and development function. And so we run administration consultancy, supply management, all those things. And then also working on more, uh, I guess, niche, smaller programs of learning and consultancy that we can deliver to our clients. Um, yeah, and I've previously worked at Brightwave, which is also part of the capital learning kind of group. So a lot of experience with products, digital learning, et cetera, all of those things. So in the digital learning space is obviously where we're all about at the moment, still stuck at home, <laughs> probably in month four or something. Um, one thing I'd love to chat through is, is this need to kind of continue to innovate. Uh, and I think you know, it is an important thing to be able to do, probably more so than ever at the moment. But Let's just kick off with why, why is innovation so important, generally speaking, but maybe specifically now in this post-COVID or COVID world we live in? Yeah, um, a big, big and good no. question. Um, I think, I mean, innovation is a word that it frustrates me quite often, actually, because I think people think of it as a big, you know, solution to something that's really out there and you know, it, it comes with bells and whistles and it's tech and it's yeah. whizzy. Um, whereas really it's about doing something better, more efficiently. Um, I think at the moment, given the, the situation we're in, the current crisis, lots of organisations have obviously realised that they they need to change the way that they do things. And that might yeah. not necessarily be on a massive scale. Um, it might just be tweaking small things like um, parts of their process but I think it's you know in order to keep um, commercially attractive keep going you know remain profitable in this kind of time and keep your workforce engaged and happy which is obviously quite a, a challenge at the moment um, innovation is really really important and it's been important for a while now I think lots of um, you know clients we work with at Capita for example in financial services there are lots of tech disruptors now yeah. um, coming into the market with new products and services all the time. So keeping ahead of that trend and competing with them when they function in a more agile and nimble way is quite difficult. So I think that will only continue as, as we go through this process as well. Yeah. So when you when you work with you know some of your clients, and we don't need to name names or anything like that, but do you find they have the capability to innovate, or is there a little capability gap there that that needs to be filled in some way? Good question. I mean, I think it's they definitely have the capability. I think there there's a few aspects to it. I guess there's the skills, capability in terms of skills and people. Yep. Um, and capability in terms of business structure and how you can adapt your services and how easily you can do that depending on your size. Um, yeah. You know, we tend to work with quite big clients, so I think that's where there might be more of a challenge. It's 
you know, a startup has maybe that has maybe 10 people, they can try and test and pilot and prototype and mm -hmm. doesn't have as much of an impact, whereas I think it can be a bit more tricky um, to get those things across the line when you're in a slightly large organisation that's always done things in a certain way, yep. might be highly regulated as well, all of those factors. Yeah, so it's sort of that old, um, the analogy of turning a bigger ship, I guess, is sort of what I'm hearing. It's, it's going to take longer, it's going to take more resources. Yeah. If you're in a little nimble, you know, startup yacht or something, <laughs> you can pivot yeah, exactly. relatively but, quickly. Yeah, but you still obviously need those skills and that's, that's what a lot of our clients are talking to us about, is how to develop these kind of critical capabilities around that would support innovation and allow them to be more agile. Um, allow them to develop new products and services that are really custom centric and I guess yeah. more in line with what the disruptor type brands are doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we talk a lot about those kind of skills and capabilities, problem solving, critical thinking, um, you know, creativity, communication. I think they're top of the agenda at the moment. How do you sort of move the needle on some of those things? So I'm hearing, you know, problem solving, creativity, you know, arguably, you know, creativity is something that's hard to learn. It'll probably be unlocked or encouraged or those sorts of things. Like how do you mm. how do you move the needle on something like that, you know, in a let's call it a three month period, right? Like what are some of the interventions you, you've seen work or, or been working through? Very good question. Um I think they're really tricky and they're tricky to to think about because we're not this is a bit kind of going back to education but we're not in terms of our education system those things aren't taught so I think when we yeah. get to this stage of like later work workplace learning interventions it's it's almost odd when you think about how much of a challenge that is because we, sh we should really have developed them but at you know, throughout our education, we tend to have information given, we digest it, and we have to you know, feed it back. And you don't develop those kind of problem solving skills, I don't think, as early on as we could, which means it's a lot harder later on. But I think where I've seen you know, things like that work well, Google, um, for example, we were looking at recently, they run a series of design sprints where they you know, take a problem um and create a team around it to try and understand the problem um develop potential prototypes solutions to it and test them so a very kind of agile way of developing a new um solution i think those kind of things work really well but what they require is obviously time mm. to do them to allow people to take you know five days out, however long out, to solve a specific problem. So I think you, you know, the solutions that work well are, are practical, the way you see people actually getting to, if you want to be a problem solver, you know, getting to actually go through the process of solving a problem. Um, yeah. As opposed to being... And at the same, yeah, you know, as opposed to going, here's how to, I don't know, an e-learning course on how to problem solve isn't really um, <laughs> You've got to get in an effective it, intervention. Yeah. yeah, you really have to get in and do it. And I think that's where it's sometimes a challenge having the space and the environment to be able to develop those skills. Um, and the time, obviously people yeah. are under pressure a lot at the moment to maintain continuity of you know, core products and services, let alone think about new ones. So yep. I think that will be quite a challenge um, in this current situation is you know, how much a company is willing to invest in innovation and the future now when they're probably a bit restricted in terms of their workforce numbers um, and just trying to keep the core business afloat. Yeah, so it's sort of differentiating them between you know, innovating that core business. So it might be, I don't know, give an example off the top of my head but you know something that's relatively straightforward but just going to deliver online or something like that versus there's an opportunity over here that's going to take a bit more time to to exploit potentially and i guess the other point yeah. google made me think they quite famously have 
I can't remember if it's a 10 or 20% of their time that is actually given to R&D. So I think that's one of the perks of working at Google that you get a day a week or something like that to work on a project of your own, which yeah. I think typically falls yeah. into, like you said, being able to step back and problem solve. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a there's a really good TED talk about why you have, I, think, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about why you have great ideas when you're like in the shower or you're just sitting in the park or something, you know, because your brain really has to, has to be switched off. Yeah. Um, so all the while you are looking at your emails, looking at everything else, um, it's very unlikely that you'll have that, that light bulb moment of, yeah. oh, wait, we could do this. It's about leaning into boredom or something like that, isn't it? Where you sort of just have to let your mind wander a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of concept, I think that yeah. Is, um, yeah, and the other, the other thing I think is really interesting is uh, allowing people to explore other topics that don't necessarily relate to what they might do in their day job, but could be relevant. So, again, to give you an example, I read a... A really good book called Invisible Women about gender oh, I've bias read that. It is very data. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's very good. So that our example of um, a female physicist who was trying to create a three D version of I can't remember what it was exactly, um, but she'd had to learn crochet when she was younger, and connected those two things immediately and thought of a way to use crochet to articulate right. and, and yeah. create a three D form of um, it was a mathematical like model, wasn't it? It was something, something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. Um, that's... And I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of the great ideas you have probably come from something completely unrelated to that idea. <laughs> it's just something you've picked up somewhere else down the line and have gone. Oh wait, that's quite similar to this. Yeah, that sort of I guess speaks to the need then you know as a as an organisation to create teams that are you know that are not in silos, right? Like pulling in. You know, if you're, going, yeah. if you're going to look to innovate, inverted commas, as it's going to be, well, let's get a working group together that's made up of, you know, 10 people from 10 completely different areas of the business and give them time and space to look at data and you know, lean into being bored, potentially, or at least, you know, think about the problem they, they're going to be solving. Yeah, exactly. I think the, I really like the idea of, you know, taking a company, taking a, a problem, a business problem that they've got, creating a kind of swap team around that problem from yeah. different disciplines, different areas of the business and, you know, giving them time to actually work on it. I think that would be a really effective way of not only trying to come up with a solution to the problem, but allowing those people to work together, learn about other parts of the business, um, learn about, you know, design, service design, product design, what actually goes into, um, all the, the products that you give to a client, I think those that process of just you know, allowing people to collaborate in that way could be a really good solution, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my mind's going further down the track to thinking about how you incentivize that as well. You know, as a if you're an executive in or well, any organization really, you know, if you're setting goals that are um, you know, maybe too easy inverted commas, it doesn't really encourage any innovation. You need to kind of be setting stretch goals and creating a culture that, that you, you, know, you could probably get there, but you're going to need to do something creative. Um, it's sort of, I guess, that, that mentality you want to be creating. Yeah, I think lots of, um, lots of organisations that we speak to as well are in that they want to be able to give employees the opportunity to understand how they might go from the kind of have three pillars of learning, I guess. It's kind of, I know what to do in my job now. I know where I can develop and progress in that but also I, I understand and know where I might go in the future and how do you get a learner for example and an employee to go from being a call center agent to a data scientist how, how do you get them to see that leap and I think those kind of collaborative problem solving yeah. um, focus sessions could be a really strong way as well of allowing people to see what other roles are about could you know spark interest and allow them to potentially move across the organization into different areas of the business rather than just you know a typical trajectory, trajectory. yeah upwards yeah kind of like lattice effect yeah yeah the um 
So Cheryl Sandberg, who calls it a, what she call it, a jungle gym, like a, you know, at the public park. All right, I'm going to ask one more question before I get carried away. How do you continue to kind of innovate while we're all working from home? Is it as simple as getting a diverse group of people together on a video call or is there a better way? Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a hard, um, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily think I've nailed it, but yeah, um, me there are definitely things I've found that we've done as a team that have helped. You can actually see my, I'm a brown paper lover and a post-it note. So, you know, having I've gone with a whiteboard. something that I can, <laughs> yeah, you need, you need something to kind of scribble on every now and then and, and just like get your thoughts down on paper rather than a screen. I definitely think there's a difference between um, yeah. writing something down and, you know, typing yeah, it really and how much it then sticks. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been trying to keep creative in that way. Um, as a team as well, we've been trying to kind of silent these Microsoft Teams, um, trying silent teams. So we might have a, a session, for example, two hours in an afternoon where we've, we're all working on the same project, but we want to just have everyone on the, on the call to bounce ideas as and when we need to. Yeah. So it kind of feels like you're in the same room. You don't need to talk to each other if you don't need to, but it creates, I guess, less of a barrier to just saying, oh, actually, you know, I've just done this. What do you think of it? Um, I think that's worked really well. And another thing that I try and do is, you know, for meetings and, I found that meetings are tricky in this environment because it's harder to get to an output always, if that makes sense. So I think because everyone's used to being on meetings all the time or on calls, we're talking, it can sometimes end up with too much talking and yep. you, you know, you have an output you need to get to, but it's hard to create the right framework to get there when you're not in a room together, when someone might go, oh, let's just pick up this paper and draw it, it, it becomes yeah. a bit harder on a, on a call. So I think if you can go into them as well with a, a templated, even if it's just, you know, a Word document with a table in it and a template, it's that kind of approach to try and That's target and channel yeah. the energy in the meeting so that you know, this is what I need to get out of it and, and this is how I will do it. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. I'm going to try that as well. Well, I'll leave it there and say thank you for joining me, Steph. If people want to connect, where can they find you? Um, yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, yeah, Steph Bright. Amazing. Thanks, Steph.